I guess my first question is going to be to everybody. So um, what are your, what's everybody's understanding of adoption and how oh. adoption comes about? Um, what answer? Um, I personally know that there's different kinds of adoption um, placements and working with CASA, I know that they're um first their first initial want is to keep siblings together and i've read studies on that as well but i think i can expand my knowledge a little more as well okay so with adoption um of course adoption comes once we get permanent custody of, of the child or the children sibling groups um so when we start talking about adoption, after the child is in care about 12 months, um, we have what we call a pre pregnancy and we come together and adopt and um, it as a pregnancy option. Breaking up a little bit, um, the, I, I thought at first it was me, but I think your audio is breaking up a little bit. Okay, let me see here. It's oh, saying... that's better. Yeah, okay. it was breaking up for me too. I mean, it may be that if video use is minima minimized for the presenter, that may help. Okay, is that any better than telling me to close some apps? So I just close some apps. I'm not sure why it would be acting up. It seems a little better. Um, okay. Um, so I have it in a window, so I'm trying to get as be best connection as I can. So sorry That's about better. that. So at, our, at, at the 12 months um, of temporary custody for a child is when we come together and try, uh, start to, to talk about um, at that point, um, um, so once they file um, the paperwork for permanent custody, um, we start um, following the case a little bit more intently than what would what we would do. Um, so. Um, once the PC hearing has taken place and a ruling is um, given by the um, court or um, the other, just, uh, a family has to appeal that rule. Um, we have uh, a reason here. I would say appeal. This county has only had 20. You seem to be breaking up um, uh, quite a bit. Is there any chance you'd be able to like call in, do the audio where you call in and maybe that would be? I could try that. If you click um, on the bottom left where it says mute, there's a little carrot right by mute. And then you can click switch to phone audio and it should pop up and give you a number to call because we can see you fine. It's just the, the audio because coming and going. Okay. So, um, the keeps, keeps popping up. It's interesting because now your audio is fine. <laughs> yeah, I don't know why it, it I, I've not had trouble all day today. So, um, well, now it seems to be working just fine. So maybe yeah. we'll I know it's almost like it's just like get when she like it's like here and there, and then you know not being able to hear up the full sentence or explanation. Okay, I'll try it again. Okay. <laughs> See if this works. Um, so as I was saying, uh, once permanent custody is granted um, through the ruling from um, Judge Stewart. The family has 30 days to appeal um, the ruling. Um, when they appeal the ruling, and I think this is really where 
um, a lot of our families get um, misled and get very confused. Um, when families try to appeal the ruling, it's not on anything that happened throughout the, the lifetime of a case. Um, an appeal only happens or can only be overturned if something happened in the courtroom. So I think a lot of families think that when they appeal the, the ruling, they're really in the case and that's not it at all. And so we have a lot of families that try to appeal and it used to be we had every family tried to appeal. It has gotten a little bit better, but um, it still delays permanency for children, which becomes a big issue. Um, in the past 30 years, oh, um, Children's Services only lost um, two appeals and one was a complete overturn. Um, the other case that the appeal, because something did happen in the courtroom, the audio wasn't picked up. So um, we just had to have a retrial and, and we were granted permanent custody. And so I think that when families are getting to the permanent custody part, that's something that needs to be really worked on with families is because they need to understand that they're not going to appeal um, the case itself. It is something that happens in the, the courtroom. Um, so once that appeal, if an appeal is filed, they have to, they have to seek out an attorney, a family does. Um, once that appeal is filed, they have four days to get an appeal filed. Um, what we have found out most recently is that if an appeal is filed within that 30 um, day time period that um, it can sit at the courthouse for however long. There's not a time limit on when it can be picked up by an attorney. If an attorney um, one of the cases that we just had recently um, was filed in November. The, the appeal was filed in November within the 30 day period. So these children were probably going to sit for another six months without having permanency granted for them, complete permanency, um, which is a very big disservice to our children. And so I, I think that we, then that our agency is going to have to work with the court um, to try and figure out some type of time limit. Um, so in a normal case, um, an appeal can take up to six months. Um, at one point, six months was the longest. Um, they would run between three to six months um, as a normal appeal period. Um, all appeals are held in um, so once an appeal comes back is really when the real work begins with adoption. Um, our adoption case workers are assigned a case. Um, it's transferred from the family services case. Um, family services has to do the very first child study. Um, child studies are very important because they tell the life of the case, they tell the life of a child. Um, so the family services caseworker has 30 days to um, produce a um, child study for our, um, our children. And then that's when the case is um, transferred over to us. Um, with an adoption, it depends on what uh, is going on with the case. Um, we like to adopt with our foster parents, but there's some kids that, you know, foster parents, they're just foster parents. And sometimes that's what they need to be. And so, you know, we have to look at that. We have to, you know, sit down and talk with the foster parents. Are you, are you interested in talking or taking these kids on to be your children? Um, some are, some aren't. Um, so if they decide that they don't want to be adoptive parents, then we have to work with our recruiter, which is Tanya Cure. Um, Tanya um, takes care of all recruiting activities for us. She um, produces flyers that we send out to agencies. Um, she will post children on a website um, for us. Now, if 
the children are in appeals, if the, the case isn't an appeal, we still do recruitment this very next just four years only. Because we can put children in foster homes um, instead of just a place. And so kind of what we're trying to sorry sorry to interrupt you started breaking up just a little bit again i'm wondering if you someone suggested that you might just stop your video and then let your mic go through and that might save some of your bandwidth okay let's see so it was much better but still occasionally going in and out okay i'll try that okay okay is that sounding better uh so far so good <laughs> <laughs> technical difficulties <laughs> we love them um so um if a child is in an appeals we can um like i said do some recruiting um we work again with tanya tanya will um, produce a flyer and send it out to look to agencies within the state of ohio um if the child is not in appeals then it can go nationwide um right now um we have a child that we're working with uh, that we sent out just a flyer because it, it looked like it was going to go into appeals. And just on flyers alone in the state of Ohio, we received over 30 home studies. Um, so that's a lot to, to read through. Um, we go through every, excuse me. So that's amazing. <laughs> it is. It's yeah. great. And, and we love that, you know, and so, um, we we read through every home study um we looked at the character we look at characteristic li list um we know what the child you know by this time we've talked to the child you, you know it, it's depending on ages they can tell us what they want you know i had a seven-year-old child that knew exactly what he wanted in a family he was able to tell me that he wanted a mom and dad and he wanted a brother and he wanted a dog you know um the younger they are it's harder for them the older they are they get very specific on what they're looking for um, so when we get these home studies we we have in mind what would be the best match for these kids so um today and yesterday um i spent um about seven hours on, on Zoom um, doing interviews for this family. And we were able to narrow it down to about seven families um, to interview for this child. So our first step in a recruiting process after Tanya finds, um, sends out our flyers and posts the children is that we, we get the home studies, we go through the home studies, and then we set up Skype, Zoom um, interviews. And we have a list of questions that we go through um, that are just specific for this time. And then um, if we like the um, families, then we set up um, in-person interviews. So we travel all over the state. Um, I think I have one, you know, for this particular child, we have one in Cincinnati. We have um, a scheduled visit for um, Cleveland, um, Columbus. So, you know, we travel far and wide. Um, we've traveled to California, there's been um, to Alabama. So whenever we think that we have found the right match, you know, we're able to make that trip. Um, we never put a child in a home that we have not visited. Um, I would never even think about trying to do something like that. Um, so once we um, get it narrowed down, um, then we'll sit down with the child um, before we actually make a match. And we have the parents, the potential parents, um, do a video or um, we've had them create books um, that tell their story to show their house, if they have dogs, you know, what they like to do. Um, because of kids of certain age, they, they need to be allowed to have input on what they want. Um, and so this way they can say, you know, we could show them there, this is potentially, you know, your home or, you know, so, um, and once we make that happen, um, we do what we call a match meeting. Um, with a match meeting, um, most of the time we have maybe one, maybe two families at the most, um, 
with this particular child that we're um, working with right now, it looks like we could have up to four families to try and weave through. Um, there's a tool that we use um, to go through a match meeting and it, whether the parents are um, appropriate, um, it goes through education, mental health, medical needs, um, because we want to make the best match that we can possibly can. So once a match would be made um, for a child, uh, our next step would be, um, and I guess with adoption, the majority of our work, we do a lot of work with the kids um, in the front end. All of the work at the back end of our um, process is, is with our parents um, and getting them to understand. Um, we laughed um, two years ago. Um, the agency was going to um, go to um, paperless and, um, and an adoption can never be paperless. So. Um, last week to prepare for an adoption i used a whole ream of paper trying to print off everything for a court um, so we we have a, a a large amount of paperwork that we have to do with parents um, so one of those first things after we make a match meeting is called disclosure um, when we meet with a family for disclosure um, sometimes i've had files that have been three file folders thick um, because the child has been in care for so long. Some of them, if the child hasn't been in care for very long, they're very thin. Um, but we have to go through every piece of paper. We get information from service providers, schools, medical. Um, once we get all that, we have to go through everything and redact anything that has a biological parent's name, number, address, birth date, um, Anybody besides that child's name that would be on a document, we have to redact. So we read through every piece of paper that comes through our agency for our, um, for our children. Um, once we do that um, and we redact everything, we have what we call our disclosure process. And so we go through each section, there's mental health, education, medical, um, service, um, visitation, I was trying to think of if there was anything else, but anything that the child has participated in, we go through every section with the family. Um, and so adoption used to be the most sued department in children's services because they always felt that we didn't, or I guess children's services didn't give enough information to adoptive parents. Um, right now, um, that's why we have to do the disclosure like we do, because we try to give our parents anything and everything that we have on this child. Um, I never want to put a child in that doesn't have, or into a family that doesn't have all the information. Um, so we sit down with our, our parents, we go through each and every um, section, they have to initial on each and every section and then they have to sign off. Once they sign off on the disclosure, um, our next step would be subsidy. Um, and so children's services, when you adopt from children's services, um, there is subsidy that's attached to that. So it's never the amount that foster care um, provides, but it, it, it can be very substantial. Um, we have ranges and so, um, you know, for, for a baby up to about five years old, you know, typically it would be about $300 a month till they're 18, possibly 21, depending on their needs. Um, so every child that comes through children's services that is adopted does receive subsidy. Um, once subsidy is agreed upon between our, our agency and um, the family, then we would um, move into what we call adoptive placement. Um, adoptive placement usually takes about three weeks after subsidy is um, decided upon. Once we um, do adoptive placement, then we move into um, the finalization process. Um, it, one of the rules for adoption is that adoption assessor has to see a family and everybody in the family. So um, say, 
um, a family has a child that, you know, lives in Athens, you know, they have their families in Athens County once, um, but they have a child that attends Ohio State that lives at Ohio State. The, the child from Ohio State has to come back to the home because we have to see them in the home, which sometimes can be very um, hard. Um, we've had um, families that have kids that are in the service, but they their home is still in Athens County. And so um, we've had people drive back from Kentucky because that's where they were stationed at, just so we can see them in the home because that's one of the rules. Um, so um, once we start our visits, there only has to be two within the home once the adoptive placement happens. But um, like I said, you have to see everybody in the home. Um, from start to finish for an adoption, depending on appeals, it can take up to maybe three months. If there's no appeal, an adoption can happen and permanency can um, take place for these children within about two and a half, three months. Um, if the appeal process lasts um, longer, um, like I said, you know, we had children that we have now, their permanent custody was done in November. So, um, but the appeal process just started in June. They'll be probably January, February before we can do an adoption for them, just because um, the way the process plays out. Um, I will say I've worked in ongoing before I started adoption and um, I enjoyed my work as an ongoing, but there's nothing better than being an adoption worker and seeing the smile on the kids' faces as they um, get their forever home. Um, some of these kids um, have put up a lot of fight. The older teenagers really put up some fight um, when it comes to permanency. But um, I had, I did an adoption for a 17 year old last year and I wasn't sure we would ever get to that point. I've worked with, with this child for a very long time and I attended her high school graduation party in, um, at the end of May. And the family is, you know, when she finally realized that this was her family and that they truly loved her and they truly wanted her, um, it was, it's a beautiful thing. Um, we try to tell kids, you know, younger and older that, you know, these parents are choosing them. This is who they want. They, they reached out to us to find a child that, you know, this is, it, it, it's different. And, you know, we have to acknowledge that, you know, their parents are still their parents that everybody can have more than one parent. And um, once a child lets that guard down and lets that love in, um, our children are truly blessed. So, is there any questions? I have a question regarding when you were mentioning nationwide and how you can, or how you go to California and different other states. Does distance have a barrier on your final decision with a family? Like if there's a family in Ohio, if there's a child in Ohio and two different families you're deciding on from Ohio and California, does it, does the distance have anything to do with the decision? Um, not necessarily. I mean, I mean, it's always nice to have a, a local in Ohio. Um, but if we feel that the best fit for that child and the best chance of success would be California, then that's what we're going to place with. Um, because that's your ultimate goal is to make sure that they are as stable and as loved as they, they can possibly be. So I have a quick question. Um, you should have a good bit on the I guess the process from your end, but what about the parents? You mentioned a child um, like a home study. Before the home study, like what happens? Do they have to go through a process to be approved to even submit the home study? Do you... So for for the um, the adoptive parents. Yes. Okay. Yeah. They they um, go through basically the same process as they would for a foster care. Um, they have to um, do pre-service training. Um, I, 
and at this point, I think that part is, at least for the state of Ohio, is changing with uh, several of the new rules. But we we ask them. Um, locally to to go through the um, pre-service training and then they apply for um, they call Tanya and ask for a home study to be um, conducted and then the home study is done and once it's approved then um, they are licensed to become a um, adoptive parent and everybody that we we've place with has to be licensed um, either that if that's in the state of California or Florida they are a license to adopt home Kim, there was a question um, from Rochelle that says, how do you deal with match meetings and having multiple families that are together that ultimately may want to adopt the same child? Isn't that hard for families? It, it, it's very hard. It's, it's difficult. Um, like I said, we're, we're probably going to come up with that uh, as well. There's a lot of discussion. Um, we have a committee. Um, it's normally, you know, the adoption team, we have the recruiter in there. Um, with a match meeting, the family that um, is interested in um, the adoption, their caseworker um, that they are licensed through um, presents their case. Um, and like I said, we have a tool that we follow. Um, and so um, it's either a yes, no, or non-applicable, basically. And, and so you go through and you check mark each what that family is able to provide. Um, so if it's a yes for one family, but a no for another family, so then you can kind of go back and, and you weigh those. Now, um, and you can score it. Um, I was trying to think if we've ever really actually scored one um, because it's a lot of discussion. Um, and that's why we do multiple interviews um, with the families is so that we have had um, interactions with them, you know, both on Skype and in person. So we can, you know, we view the home, we, we do a safety audit when we go into the home, um, just for our own, you know, I know that they have been licensed, but I want to see that for myself. Um, and any caseworker will, would want that too. And so when we do the match meetings, and trying to decide um, which is the best fit, um, Sometimes, you know, I had one that we had four families and it was like a two and a half, three hour meeting on which family that we really felt was the best fit. And, and, um, and it's difficult. Um, I, I was telling my caseworker yesterday when we were um, interviewing the families, you know, I liked every one of the families and I hate to break somebody's heart. Um, because these families, you know, they put a lot into wanting to adopt and they've put their hearts on their sleeves. Um, but we have to do what's best for our children and, and making that decision. And so, um, yeah, it, it, it's a difficult, that, that part is really difficult when we have more than one family. Um, I have a question. This is Suzanne. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, what happens when you place a child and then it doesn't work out or does that happen? It does happen. Um, mm -hmm. We've had um, some disruptions and, and we, we start all over again. Um, what we would do is, you know, if, if it's not going to work out and we can see that. Um, and so one of the things with, once we get into adoptive placement a child has to be in a home for six months before adoption can even happen um so um and and the reason why we do that is because we want to see that that it is going to work so if it's a new family for like the child that i'm working with right now um that child would have to be placed in that home for six months and so we we spend six months going in and out of the home and, and working with them and working with their uh, excuse me, um, providers, service providers, to make sure that this is really the best match. Um, we felt that when we placed them, but you know things change, um, kids' behaviors change, and so um, if we have to disrupt that, then then we do that, and then we start over again. Um, I will say we had a big disruption about five years ago um, with the family and um, 
we had to remove the children from the adoptive placement, but every one of those children have now been adopted by somebody else. And so in the end, you know, what we found was a much better match. Okay, there's another question. Oh, okay. sorry, go ahead, Tara. There's another question from Alicia. Um, that's how do you handle a situation where a child prefers one family, but you feel the child is best placed with another family? Um, well, that's why, you know, we don't necessarily meet, have the family meet the children before we make a match. We, we have them do like a book or um, a video. They don't have any interaction with the children beforehand um, just because um, we don't want to overwhelm a child. Um, so, you know, they can have a book and, and look at that, uh, or like I said, a video. Um, and, and we want their input if they're age appropriate to be able to say, you know, this is, you know, what I like best about this home is this. Um, and so, um, and that allows a, a child of a certain age, you know, age range to have some control over where they might be placed. Um, sometimes a kid, the children are able to really verbalize what they want. Sometimes they can't. Um, but once, and, and I guess, um, you know, one of the families that we did that with most recently, uh, the adoption finalized this year, was that um, he was just overwhelmed with um, emotion and what he saw in that family. And it was like instantaneous. So once he started really talking with them, once we allowed that part to happen, um, the love for the family grew before we ever even placed him there. So, you know, sometimes it's a good thing, you know, um, but we have to take that cautiously. Kim, there's another question from Anne. Do you make, do you ever make arrangements for the bio parents to visit the adoptive family or does visitation always stop with permanent custody? Visitation always stops at permanent custody. Um, we try to take that slowly if we can. Um, sometimes um, visitation, um, it, when we have what we call, we they used to be called goodbye, goodbye visits. We try to call them transition visits now because we know that in the future, um, the data shows us that um, the children will eventually try to contact their birth family and, and, and that's okay. And, you know, when we're working with the adoptive parents, we have to, you know, acknowledge that and allow the birth family to say, you know, that or the adoptive family to know that, you know, social media has dictated that. And so the more open you are, the better off your relationship with your family is going to be with the children. Um, but when we do our goodbye or transition visits, um, we try to do them um, in person if we can. And, and we ask that the, we have a meeting with the, the birth family beforehand and ask them to write a letter um, if they're able, some parents just are not able to do that. They're not able to let that go. And, and it's hard and I get that. Um, but some kids need to have that release. And so, you know, we try to work with the birth families as much as possible before the, the goodbye visit to have them write the letter saying that it's okay. We're, you're going to be fine. And that mom loves you or daddy loves you. You know, right now we just can't be together. Um, but we have to be able to have that separation because we have to allow um, our adoptive families a chance to build that bond. Um, and if birth family um, is involved, then that just is never going to happen. Okay, there's a couple more questions. Um, could you um, go over one more time about the disclosure sign off and what that includes? Okay, um, like I said, our disclosure um, with, when we do the redaction and we have our disclosure documents, we have, I think it's a five page um, report um, that it goes through everything. And so the, the adoptive family has to initial on every um, section and they have to, you know, if 
if it's not in there, then we have to add, we have to be able to tell them why it's not in there. So one of the things on our disclosure document is um, the adoptive placement date and paperwork. Well, that's not included in the disclosure because we've not set that date yet. So we're able to tell the family this isn't in here, but they also have to sign off that we told them that it's not in here because of we haven't got to that point yet. So um, it is a long document. Um, they get a lot of paperwork. They also get a copy of the disclosure. So at any point, if they come back and say, you know, I think maybe we didn't really get this. Can you look? Um, we're able to go back in. Um, but um, I think they get just about anything and everything that we see that the child goes through. Okay, another question is, um, what is the time limit um, for foster parents who the child is with um, to decide if they really want to do the adoption? Because we do see that sometimes where families are kind of in a, we, we aren't sure, maybe, or like, you know, sometimes behaviors set those things back. Um, what do you guys, how do you handle that? Um, it, it really is a, a child by child basis. Um, if um, foster parents are, um, I had, you know, a, a, another example is um, the child that I had that I just recently adopted, I guess last year, that was 17 years old. She was in the, the foster home for three years um, before she was adopted. Um, and when we placed her there, um, it was for adoption, that's that's what they that's why they became foster parents was to adopt only. They even had to go through um, re, um, to recertify, um, but they had made that decision to um, go through. And they were going to because she was older. She you know, and she had said, "I'm not going to be adopted. I'm not going to be adopted." Um, they were willing to just be foster parents for the, you know until she aged out. We don't like that to happen, um, but we were willing you know, with this family to do that because the, the child was older um, and, and it was a, a solid placement. It was a great placement. Um, but then, um, you know, they had, she was the one that asked them to adopt her um, after the summer. And it was a, it was a, an up and coming battle the whole summer, um, but come September, when she had been placed there for her third year, um, she went to them and said, you know, I, I want you to adopt me. And, um, which it was amazing on everybody's part. And, uh, but, you know, again, it, it's, it's a child by child basis on if, and um, when we can make the decision. We don't like kids to linger. Um, if we can provide permanency sooner than, later is is the best for the child um, most of the time we can work with the foster parents um, if they've been in the home for a while um, they'll say can you give me you know a month or two to and, and we will do that but we also know that we we don't want to um, prolong it if we don't have to okay there's another question um that says that families that go through adoption agencies typically fill out forms that ask them about which children they're willing to adopt. For example, age, race, groups. Are there specific groups of children in Athens County who are less likely to be adopted? Can you share more about those children? And for example, maybe large sibling groups. Um, large sibling groups are very hard to place, um, but we've been able to manage to do that. Um, we. We have a sibling group of four that we got notification today that their finalization date is August 13th. Um, last year we had a sibling group of five or six, I'm trying to remember how many that was. Um, so it's not impossible, but it does become harder. Um, but we also have, there's families out there um, with these other agencies or, you know, private adoption agencies that are looking for sibling groups um, that have, you know, that don't have any children and, and have always wanted at, at least two, possibly three kids, um, but are, are willing. You know, it's harder, but it, it's doable. And then I guess maybe I, you know, curious too on that end on the, um, 
just kind of the behaviors and the age of children, you know, if we're a teenager age and there's a lot of behaviors in their child study, you know, is that a, is that a typical, you know, uh, group of children that's hard, harder? Um, yes. <laughs> you know, I guess um, age is always harder. The older they are, the harder it harder it is. Um, but again, like I said, you know, the 17 year old, um, she asked them to adopt her. Um, so it's, it's not impossible, but it does make things harder. Um, a lot of children um, have the loyalty to their family, the older they are, they, and they remember. Um, and, and that's one of the things that I always tell my, my families is kids probably from the age of four and five, they know their family. They know that they had siblings that might be older. They know that the, who their mom and dad, they know their grandparents. And so it, it becomes harder the older they get. Um, behaviors are always um, a struggle, um, depending on what the behaviors are. Um, you know, there's agencies out there that we've worked with that um, are specific to um, children with medical issues. Um, I have adopted three three boys um, with medically fragile homes, but that's what they that that's what they worked with. Um, that's what they were comfortable with. And and you know when I first started in adoption, I would have never thought that children would like that would have ever been adopted. Um, I just couldn't imagine that, but there are special people and I call them the angels um, because they're willing to take these children on for the rest of their lives. Um, behaviors depending, you know, uh, when we have to write out our child studies and we have to do a child study, um, an update every six months for children or every time that they would move or disrupt a home. Um, child studies are, are a good thing because they tell the story, but they also, um, can be hurtful in us trying to find a, a family because we have to put everything in them. Um, so if there's ongoing behaviors or increased behaviors, those go into a child study and a family reads those. Um, some families can look past that um, and um, are willing to work and forge um, forward, um, but you know it, it, it becomes um, a preference for the families. Um, so, yeah. And there's another question in the chat from Wendy, and it's how many Athens County children get to stay in the area? And if they do stay in the area, are there ever issues with seeing their biological family around? Um, the majority of our kids actually stay in the Athens County area. Um, we have a few, you know, I, I've done adoptions in Cincinnati. I've done them in Ashland, Ohio, um, Cleveland. Like I said, we've done a couple out of state, um, but the majority of our, our, our adoptions are local. Um, there's always a chance that they can run into birth family. Um, and, and we tell our families that, um, but our, our adoptive families are prepared and, and they're ready to, um, you know, if that happens. Um, I don't hear a lot of our adoptive families saying that um, they've run into birth families. You know, I'm sure it happens, but they don't call and let us know that it's going on, um, but I'm sure that it happens. Tracy's asking, once an adoption is completed, how long does ACCS stay involved with the family? So once an adoption is finalized, we are one of the few agencies, at least in the local area. So probably, I think Fairfield County has a post-adoption agency. Franklin County has a post-adoption agency. Athens County has a post-adoption um, department, I guess is what it is. Um, and so, um, our post-adoption person is Laura, and she does a phenomenal job. And um, she's in contact with a lot of our adoptive families. So I talked about um, subsidy. And so every adoptive family receives some type of subsidy um, once they adopt a child from um, Children's Services. There's also funding out there that's federal, and it's called post-adoption subs... Uh, P-A-S-S-S. -S -S. Um, 
and I had that right before I got logged on here today. And um, but it's a federal it's a federal amount of money, and it, it's to help children that have been adopted through child welfare. That's it's specific to um, children. And so um, some counties, um, because it is federal money, some of the money can it's it's up to about fourteen thousand dollars per year per child. Um, but it's used to help um, subsidize like um, services. Um, I had a family in um, Cincinnati that, um, like I said, had um, one of my angels, my medically fragile children. They, that's what they were always working with and they um, needed help redoing their home and they had to put in an elevator because one of the children in their home was in um, a wheelchair and they had a four-story home and so that's the money that federally federal money that could be used to help alter their home so there's a lot of different um, things out there to help our families um, and and that's what Laura's job is so once they're um, the adoption is finalized, then Laura steps in. Um, she sent out, I think, something like 57 um, applications were passed. It's a an application. Um, and, and again, like I said, it can go up to about $14,000 per child per year. Um, but that's something that um, we see as an agency that is extremely important is to have that post-adoption worker because you know, if a, a family goes into crisis, they need to be able to reach out to somebody. I think Tracy, have... to answer the question for the GAL, um, the CASA guardian ad litem job, um, our appointment ends when, a, when an adoption is finalized. So we do not stay involved past that adoption finalization. I don't know if that was said or not. I just wanted to make sure I answered that part. I don't think I did say that. Okay, cool. Um, and then there was one more question about um, kind of the affordability of adopting through the agency. Um, and I know you talked about the programs to help um, after, but what is the um, process for like adopting a child, I guess, financially? So um, in, in the state of Ohio, um, one of the things that um, Children's Services offers is um, payment um, for adoption. So what we do and what most counties do is that um, once a, an attorney is contacted, most attorneys only charge about $1,000 for an adoption and our agency covers that 100%. So um, at no time does any of our families ever see um, a bill from an attorney. It comes directly to our agency and it gets paid through us. Great. Well, I think we are just about at the end of our time. Um, so I'll share. Thank you, Kim. <laughs> welcome I'm so sorry for the technical difficulties <laughs> you know and it's it's raining so maybe that you know I feel like that impacts my uh, my connection anyways no and once you went off video we heard you great so that was that was okay, good yeah good great well Kim we really appreciate that you took the time um, at the end of your work day I'm sure <laughs> um, to stay on and talk with us obviously you can tell we had a lot of questions so yes, I'm thank you, you. and answered all of those for us um, everyone, and we'll make sure we'll pop the recording up on the SAO COTLA page um, um, for any of you that may have missed parts of it or anything like that. Um, otherwise, stay tuned for next. We'll have another virtual Casa de Casa next month. Stay tuned for more information from Tara on that. And thank you all very, very much. Thanks, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Mm-hmm.